Hello and welcome to another episode of Dear Gardener. You join me once again in Copenhagen, this time in the lime tree mist season. It hasn't rained here for weeks now. I've been away, but the evidence is everywhere in the ground. I was able to tease out roots of ground elder from the sand that were two foot long in my gardening this afternoon. And I say lime tree mist because the only moisture in the air is when you cycle along or walk along under one of the great lime tree avenues. I was cycling past a very well-known place in the city called Castellan, this ancient fortification. Well, not, not that ancient, but this fortification that has a lime avenue next to it. And there was this mizzle of aphid secretion falling from the trees. It was probably one of the the rare examples where we are able to perceive the microflora, the microfauna around us. We're bathed constantly in this air plankton, this mixture of fungal parts and microscopic spores and bits of bacteria and virus, and we don't really notice it. And this, this tiny little, little um, jetting from creatures smaller than us was, a, was probably just about perceptible to us. I like it because it is the bane of the big shiny car. More street trees should be lime trees. Sorry, more street trees should be lime trees because they make things sticky. They spoil the people who want to spend as much as a small house on a very big, shiny, ugly Range Rover that looks like a cross between a, a tank and a shark. So I'm very happy with them. The other time that we notice this time of year is the laburnums. The laburnums are out in full, magnificent flower. We're a little behind the UK, where they have probably faded to white and started to disappear from the streets. But here, they are still out in brilliant yellow. They're a fantastic tree and very, very dear to me because they're fading from ornamental programs. You still see them in their self-seeded iterations. I took a wonderful photograph this week, which I'll put onto Instagram as part of a photo montage of laburnums I took, of a self-seeded laburnum in the railway embankment, yellow with a horribly clashing red train going past. And you still get them there and you see them along the major roads, the seeds travelling along those corridors. But in gardens, they're going. And they were once the most common ornamental shrub, along with lilac. And now, no more. They suffered terribly from the reputation they picked up for being absolutely deadly poisonous. And they did. They did kill some full-grown adults. They're normally, they're normally implicated in sickness and tummy sickness in children who eat the little pea-like things because children are curious in that way. Interesting pea-like thing in the Fabiaceae family, the child says. Probably in the, the Fabioidae subfamily as well. I'll, I'll give it a munch, but no, 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 this is poisonous. The adult poisonings came when there was this Victorian craze for Rabinia fritters, Rabinia pseudoacacia, again, in the, in the same pea family, Fabiaceae, in the same tribe, Fabioidae, but a very different tree with a much more creamy, fragrant, nectar-rich flower that was fried up by Victorian home chefs into a, a perfumed fritter. Laburnums, I don't think, produce nectar, whereas Rabinia is famous for the quality of its nectaries. Laburnums are just, just pollen bribers. They give the insects who visit them, the bees, a big lump of pollen to take home and feed to their little grublets. Pollen is the protein-rich part of the floral offering. I suppose that's why laburnums flower now, because this is the time to, to hatch some grubs, to fill one's hive with little creatures. Anyway, it's a, a very lovely tree. I went out and about in this part of the world, in Ustabro, and took probably 12 minutes to take 
25 pictures of laburnums peeking above walls and dotting, peppering the embankments. I won't say blazing the embankments because I don't think it's a fire colour. It's always been traditionally a fiery colour in poetry and descriptions because I guess it's yellow. But I think it's just such a clear and non-combusting yellow. It has none of those little flickers of orange or even bits of blue that come out in in really good fire. I think Tennyson writes of it as dripping wells of fire. That's in, in memoriam. And it's not... I'm sorry, Tennyson. I think, I think Tennyson's a first-rate observer of plants and flowers. And that same poem has one of the best, one of the best lines of botanical description when he talks about when rosy plumelets bud the larch, which is just such a great, great way of describing that very characteristic larch rose, the little flower that you see, the female flower of, well, it's not really a flower, is it? It's, it's an open cone on larch in late Feb, early March. You see all the Instagram influencers uh, go out. I can't really talk because I'm kind of a plant influencer, I guess. But there's this particular Instagram influencer aesthetic where you put your face next to it and say, wow, isn't nature brilliant? Isn't nature amazing? Look at these little, look at these great little nubbins. And do you think, why are you trying? Why try to describe it when rosy plumelets has been used already. I think a rosy plumelet is how I like to think of my my little son. A little rosy, rosy plumelet. Anyway, the rosy plumelets have long gone. The laburnum no longer drips fire, but drips a, drips a lovely plasticky yellow. It's the yellow of a, a football shirt, the, the Columbia shirt, or the head of a, of a yellow Lego man if we're going to use more of a, a Danish comparator. A, a, uh, and the laburnum dripping Lego heads of fire. Dripping wells of Lego heads. Dripping yellow Lego heads. There we go, Tennyson. A little, a little bit of a, a suggestion for you. Anyway, they are mostly round here that very conum, common uh, hybrid. That very common cross, the laburnum cross waterii, which is a cross between laburnum alpinum and laburnum anagaloides. Those are the two real native European caucus laburnums. And I think it's a naturally occurring cross, but it's particularly brilliant because it combines two of the essential characteristics of these plants that the other lack. So it combines the density on the raceme, on the, the flowering thing of the laburnum anagaloides with the length of raceme, the sheer, the sheer foot-longedness of laburnum alpinum, which is why you can get them so petal dense, so yellow to block out the brightest blue sky. <laughs> to block out the brightest blue sky, rather. A wonderful, a wonderful plant. We have a, another that we occasionally see. That's probably Voiceyi, probably that cultivar that I've been looking at and that you'll see on my Instagram at, at the Ben Dark, the photos of. Uh, Voiceyi is the one that really, really took off in popularity and is the, the pure uh, chain, golden chain tree. The other laburnum that I've been dealing with recently here has been up on a Kolonihewa, up on the very characteristic little Danish half allotment, half thinker, half dasher kind of setup that they have here. Everyone retreats to the Kolonihewa when the weather sets hot for those glorious two weeks. And up there they have a Libernocytisus which is sometimes called Adam's laburnum or Adam's laburnocytisus. It's a chimera tree, a tree where a broom 
the cytosis has been grafted onto a laburnum and the two grow together so that even on the same branch some flowers are the plum plum blossom muddy purple of the broom and others are the pure football shirt yellow of the laburnum it's a magnificent thing i always thought that it was called laburnocytosis adamii or adam's laburnocytosis because of its almost heretical nature that it was a creation of man and not of god but it turns out actually that there was a nursery in france who first tried this this experimental grafting and ended up with this rather strange thing they were trying to grow a standard like you do sometimes with robinia you graft robinia top onto a, a tall stem and get a big mop of robinia flower on a long straight stem and they were trying to get a almost cascading head of purple broom on a laburnum straight growing trunk instead they got a mash of genetic material i think that the laburnum growth in the middle tends to form more of the, the the middle wood and then the broom around the outside though i could have gone out completely the wrong way around anyway the broom dies first generally and it reverts slowly slowly back to being a laburnum back to god away from the hand of man i guess you could say it's not unwelcome because it's the right color it's a purpley color and it's a purpley color that is enough to take the edge the acid edge off that laburnum yellow the classic classic laburnum companion they're out together at the moment is of course the lilac which flowers around the same time at around the, the same height or perhaps a, a little bit shorter but looks somehow more more of this world less of nat unnatural like burnham looks great against the bright blue sky where it can fight it but otherwise it can look a little bit like a a, a big lump of nylon at the end of the garden and the lilac is a murky flowerer it has mud in its composition there is something unclean in its blooms and i mean unclean in the best sense unclean as in musky unclean as in complicated it goes i guess with the, the wonderful scent but there is a a murk to the purple and even the white doesn't come across in that retinally scorching white it is a white that has a hint of pewter almost before it flowers and then almost immediately there is brown on the panicle brown little bits of flower alongside the the others and the white lilac is a panicle not a racine you you might have noticed the difference in terminology it, it branches a lot more while as the the laburnum goes receiving straight down like a wisteria receives icicle like from from the tree so anyway yes <laughs> lilac lilac i think for for decades has been used by sensitive gardeners who want to avoid their hedgerow having the effect of a a tropical fruit drinks label it is a good hedgerow plant and i'm talking big old fashioned hedgerows that might be half a garden's width thick things that most of us don't have time for now and that are are sadly dying out and i was thinking about hedgerows today as i walked past our neighbor's house our neighbor's house is home to it's, it's not our direct neighbor there there are a few houses down around a corner but they're home to one of these giant trampolines bane scourge of all good gardening or so i thought when we first moved in here we were told there's a trampoline in the garden do you want it to stay and i thought well my my son will have to forgive me later when he learns of it when he listens to this episode of dear gardener for he knows not that 
I called for its removal before I arrived and re-sowed the grass straight away because I absolutely loathe them in gardens. I've never seen them done well. Even when sunken, they take too much and they require a flat garden and flat effects around them to make them look natural. But here, they have made it work. They have this huge trampoline with the full sides up but they buried it in shrubs, buried it high in in cornus, in lilac, in laburnum, in apple, and in vigilia. And it now forms a barely visible circular clearing within this great mass of shrubs, this great flowering hedgerow. And today when I walked past, the children were in there. They were using it as a den, as a treehouse, as a clubhouse, hidden away, just sitting on its on its plastic surface, chatting and, and sharing whatever secrets children have. I thought it was wonderful. It was a den, a grove, an extra garden room, just one with a sprung floor. So there's a tip for anyone who has wondered how... They can get some alone time from the children that isn't TV-based, send them out there to do something on the trampoline, yet still retain some charm, some elegance, some magic in their garden. There you have it. It all relies on Victorian shrubs. Anyway, I am back from Hampshire, where I was spending some time with my father, who has now very, very sadly died. And I won't go into all of that on this because there are many podcasts out there for hearing tales of of grief and, and heartbreak but he was a very very wonderful man anyway it got me thinking about afterlives fairly fairly naturally and the afterlives of gardens more particularly because i'm obviously an obsessive and I like to talk to all of you about gardens. And while I was back, I climbed over the fence from my childhood garden to the abandoned garden next door, where an old chap from the village, who who's now died as well, used to grow show chrysanthemums and dahlias in the most brilliantly old-fashioned, chemically-drenched lines of pom-pom heads. They look like something from a sort of My Little Pony themed bath time scrubbing kit. All all poofs and purples and, and pinks. Really wonderful and eloquent sort of display of, of, of care from, from whom a man who was quite taciturn and never really well, I didn't speak to him. I suppose as a child, I didn't speak to anyone. I just mumbled and, and stared at the floor. But anyway, <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm over romanticising the the figure and his relationships with plants. But the garden is now reclaimed by the by the brambles, by the elder, by the seas of nettles. The only plant of cultivation that remained from those days were the forget-me-nots, which were everywhere. But forget-me-nots grown leggy and woodlandy grown into a knee-high understory between the the nettles who are still <laughs> who are still running on the fumes of those years of of manure and chemical drench it's a it's a strange way to claim connection is that a collection with the man it is it is a plant that he probably introduced but in the most untypical way it is it is him but him grown monstrous or perhaps grown innocent i don't know it's a um it's a topic that i was thinking about in the week that we had the news that munstered wood jekyll's garden has been preserved for the nation by by the National Trust. We will see. I wonder what Vita Sackville West would have thought about the National Trust preserving things for the nation. I wonder if she thought the nation deserving of nice things or the National Trust capable of <laughs> delivering them. I am not Vita Sackville West. I, I like the National Trust. So I can I can take the news with, with the joy that the rest of the nation has. 
But Jekyll obviously is long gone, 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 gone into a series of owners stretching back. Um, well, not beyond her because she built Munstead Wood, but stretching from her through through estate agents, land sales again and again, through a restoration as a, as a private garden. But what of her will remain? I'd like to think that you try to keep something of the spirit as they do at Gravetight, as they do with, with William Robinson. But I hope that they don't just focus on the plantings, on the famous colour borders. And they also retain something of her real appreciation for craftsmen, for skill, for vernacular arts. She um, she does get lumped in with William Robinson all the time, and obviously she does, because she worked with him so closely in, in the writing. But I think you can clump her with, with the other William, with William Morris as well. I mean, she wasn't ever a, a member of of his guilds and I doubt she would express socialist sympathies though we can ascribe them to her and many merrily do not not that's not the only thing ascribed to her. I saw I saw a tweet celebrating on International Lesbians Day great lesbians of horticulture and they had Vita Sackville West of course and Constance Spry of, of course and then Gertrude Jekyll in the picture as well and I thought well what a poor Jekyll done what's poor Gertrude done not not that, that it's a bad thing at all but I don't think there's any discussion of her sexuality at all in her writings and she didn't marry and she wore men's boots but uh, anyway that that's that's beyond the point I think that she has this arts and crafts affinity to her in the way that she had an instinctive respect for local hand the the local forearm the native genius of, of a person of a craftsman this sort of i don't know medieval almost well it's not medieval is it it's it's pre-raphaelite medievalism but that that sort of love of the the honesty of man expressed through through toil you can see it in in all of those little trips she did out Lutchens when when he was young and she was already old and they were driving around in their little horse-drawn gig around the the lanes and byways of Surrey collecting drawings of, of vernacular architecture of gateways and gateposts and eaves and that something of that should remain in any updated style they do in all of the tea houses and crafts rooms that surriness of well not surriness of you but that 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 worship of the the local <laughs> i was thinking of her and lutchens and their little jaunts out together in search of interesting curiosities when i was reading my my proust last night the um the inevitable proust reference for the podcast you can you can sound the klaxon and and tick that one off but he's i was reading the bit in in um Sodom and Gomorrah in book four when he's taken Albertine out in the car for the first time and this is the first appearance of the car in the story and in their lives and he the supreme observer the narrator is talking about how it doesn't just impact the way that we talk about distance, the way we talk about miles and kilometres, it affects art, it affects the way we see the world around us. Suddenly villages that would never, ever have been seen by human eyes in the span of the same afternoon are pulled together, become part of an itinerary so that the woods between them, the road that separated you from these great destinations, where they be a, a place with a church or someone you're trying to chat up or shag, they lose all of that and become things that cluster around tea time, in his, in his magnificent words, clustering around the tea time. And we have... I don't know, I think of this in the coach trips between Wisley and Dixter and Sissinghurst. Is there a difference in the way that we see things now? Or is, 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 
<laughs> is with Cheekle and Lurchin's Munstead Wood that they built together have been different. Munstead is such a product of the 1890s when a day's jaunt took you to Godalming and surroundings and back again. And how different would it have been? How different would their creations have have been if you drew a drawing inspiration from a day's jaunt up to, to Manchester? The uh, Ocean Colour Scene song. To, anyway, the day trip to Manchester. It's a question that I think about a lot in terms of garden visiting. Is does accessibility devalue things and it's a horrible horrible thing to say because great things and gardens amongst them should be for everyone but at the same time I know that if I've hiked to a viewpoint to a picnic spot if I've sweated to get there and there was a little tear in my leg a little aesthetic wound somewhere I appreciate it more and I stay longer and somehow find it more beautiful and surely it is the same for a garden there's this um, National Trust garden that doesn't have a car park at Woolbidding and I think there's so much romance just added by that the fact that you have to either hoik yourself there on bicycle seat or walking boot or you wait in Midhurst car park for a shuttle bus to pick you up which has a glamour of its own almost like a start of a country house weekend and it makes it somehow all the more precious makes everything there better gardening it's a, it's a top tip for for today if you want people to appreciate your garden more put a climbing wall in front of it make them haul their way up there and then is the opposite true are gardens that are too readily reached by car devalued the obvious example of this is Wisley, which I always think as a sort of car park, garden centre garden, which is terribly unfair because there is brilliant, 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 brilliant gardening going on at Wisley, some of the best. But the fact that it is there wedged between the, the A3 and the M25, it makes it somehow blue water shopping centre, Westfield like in my mind. And I, I can't help that. I bring prejudice and, and so does everyone else to their gardens. Uh, there's um, Tim Richardson, the the journalist, always going on about visiting gardens by by train and and by folding bike. His points are more about the landscape and setting and vernacular rather than pure suffering. But there is something about experiences being more profound if you have bled for them, and <laughs> that's why pilgrimages exist of course those ladies uh well, gentlemen flying across the atlantic to, to see sissinghurst really are on a pilgrimage because gosh it's awful and you have to land at heathrow and battle through british customs could anything be worse at the moment that is as much as you'd see on the santiago de compostela or the the road to lords so really when people say i'm on a pilgrimage to sissinghurst it's true they are on a pilgrimage they are <laughs> you could you could rewrite the Canterbury Tales, where you're so inclined, at the back of a big, long, grey bus on the ride between Hidcott and Dixter. I wonder what tales would come out from the masses there. I'm sure they'd just be just as bawdy and lewd as the others we're familiar with. Anyway, that's my thought on... What was my thought on? Afterlife of Gardens, Monstered Wood. My poor father, my poor neighbour, and, and Chico's boots. I know I've been talking for an age, and I promise to stop very soon, but that talk of Woolbedding, that talk of the Midhurst Garden, reminds me that on the day after um, the big, the, the big events, I had to get out and clear my head, so I went for a long cross-country run, a long run on the footpaths, between Petersfield and Midhurst. Very, very close to Woolbidding. It's on the, the Serpent's Trail. I think I did about 20 kilometres, all of it on little footpaths and bridleways, and I saw no one at all. I ran through a wild campsite with some people swishing 
badminton rackets around and and looking very carry on camping that looked very good fun and i ran past a dog walker this was in half term in the uk in beautiful weather in the south of england one of the most densely populated parts of the world and it is deserted all of the people on trips bundle into cars no chance to see a, a jekyll and luchins in their little in their little gig riding past no chance to see a rider no chance even to see a bicycle a bicycle a bicycle everyone is tucked away and siloed it was really quite fascinating i think having lived in cities for so long i obviously grew up in a, in a town like petersfield in fact in petersfield and you forget how towns that size just end. They just finish. You go past the last housing estate and the leisure center, and there is a line where there was town and now there is not. And in that town part, there are people wandering to and fro in, in little mission mode, in little get to the shops, in little meet my friends, in little take Jimmy to the swimming pool. And then the rest of it is this deep, deserted nothing. It's like stepping from a coral reef with all the pretty flitting fishes into that deep step off abyss. I think if you were an extreme extrovert, a relier on people, you might feel something sink in your stomach as you realise it's just you and the birds. I loved it, obviously. I think gardeners and runners are quite a common shared hobby because they do attract people, not necessarily weirdo, loner, solitary people, many of them as well, but people who are happy in their company, own company rather. And it was gorgeous. It was the most amazing head-clearing run. There were two standout moments. The first was where I lost the path in a field that had just had its first hay cut. I was running in the evening at about 7 o'clock. This must have been cut that morning at about 10 on a hot day. So it was just drying out. The first hay cut is the one that takes out the wiry stems, the flowering stuff. It's quite long and loose. And I'd lost the path completely because prior to that, the path had obviously been trod through the wild grass. With this gone, it had ceased to exist. I had to search for it by peering at the ground and seeing if there was a little extra patch of green where light had once been able to hit the ground. But anyway, all of this hay lay drying on the ground and it had turned the most wonderful glaucous eucalyptus unnatural blue i say unnatural because we don't see that color in the english countryside it was something from the blue mountains or at least something from more of an olive grove and it had almost a sort of transcendent moment it just took me away took me somewhere else and of course it it smelled of it smelled of the hay cut uh, which is brilliant. And it was comedy as well, because they've got to have some comedy with your tragedy, because all the female pheasants who'd been using the, the hay, obviously, as shelter, I hope not as nests, but I guess, but maybe, um, were st still using it to hide. Sorry, I started that anecdote thinking it was going to be comic, but now I worry that their, their nests have been chewed down by the hay gut, and it's actually another incidence of tragedy. Let's keep it. Let's keep it as comedy. Let's say that they were still thinking that they were able to, to duck away and, and hide from my puffing, panting steps. And the second moment that I really enjoyed, again, it was a, it was a take you away from it all moment. It was up on Ipping Common, where they have a huge problem with the invasive rhododendron ponticum that southern european um Balkan caucasus plant that is well again introduced by the victorians and now taking over understories taking over acid sands much like this sand i was running on but here it was gorgeous i'm used to seeing it in places like down in cornwall where, where you see the great masses of elegance and it's blobbed, it's so dense, it is, is mounded by its time in direct sun and the, the dilute, washed out tone of its flower doesn't look appealing there. It almost looks like a blueberry kind of bleeding out on, on the big lumpy mound of, of Padlova. It's not, a, it's not an enticing colour. But there, in the deep shade of this pine wood, they were stretched out to the light, echelated, reaching for the rays. And they looked beautiful, heart-stoppingly beautiful. They were otherworldly and 
I don't know, somehow, again, reef like, again, like, like sea anemones, like creatures of, of the deep. It was, it was really gorgeous. They reminded me of those light starved camellias you see in the, the, Elizabeth, the Isabella plantation in Richmond Park that have been stretched out so much finer and so much more like the camellias you see in those first sort of Japanese woodcuts that started camellia mania where you actually see branches and sparsity and uh, exciting exciting um, arrangements of bloom not just glossy leaf big fake flower glossy leaf big fake flower so anyway these rhododendrons were probably devilish absolute swine for the poor rangers who have to deal with them but my goodness, they were they were beautiful and they were there and they were flowering and along with everything in those 20 kilometres flowering for me alone, which was which was uh, lovely. Anyway, right. I swear it. This podcast is going to finish. It's on its way out. But I have some housekeeping first. I must say a huge thanks to to Vaughan and to the anonymous donor who supported the podcast on Ko-Fi at ko-fi slash Ben Dark. It really meant a lot to me and it does help keep all of this stuff chugging along. Do remember to go out and look at the pictures of those Liburnum I took on the wander around Oosterbroem. You can see seeded on a railway track, growing near a pylon, peeking over a hedge, in company with its glorious companion, the murky and majestic lilac. <laughs> Sorry, I faded out a bit there because I was, <laughs> I was talking to my wife about, I was going to talk about laburnum, and she was saying that how laburnum was Stalin's favourite tree. And I wondered if I should mention that, but then, then we worked out together that actually... Uh, <laughs> And mimosa, mimosa is Stalin's favourite tree. My wife knows a lot about things like Stalin, but little about yellow flowered trees as it would go on. Anyway, there is a YouTube channel now for these things. This one will be my face, I guess, talking to you about the... What's this? What is this with my face? If you're watching on YouTube, this is my face. And that is at Dear Gardener TV, all one word, Dear Gardener TV. You can see the Hangers Walk video and this one. <laughs> I'm also speaking soon, very, very soon, in Birmingham at Selly Manor on Sunday the 18th of June. It's Father's Day, so you can come along and bring your father. It's what my father would have wanted <laughs> to guilt trip you there. It's part of Independent Bookshop Week. And your ticket comes with a free copy of The Grove in which I will write anything you like. Anything at all. <laughs> um, or you can just buy a copy anyway and, um, and write your own thing in it. Um, thank you very much also to Guns Illustrated, who gave The Grove a wonderful review this week. Uh, really, really nice to see that a year after it came out but for the paperback release. So that was really, really nice and gave me another boost as if, as if boosting were needed. So thank you for listening to this. I hope you enjoyed it. I think I'm going to have a guest on very soon. We'll go back to the guests, but... Thank you for suffering through, through me on my own and for listening to this. I love you all. Goodbye. <laughs>